Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Lids, and we're back with some more Marduk. And like I was saying at the end of the previous episode, we are now technically into what is Marduk Chapter 3, which was previously its own separate game. It came out about three years or so after Marduk Chapter 2, during which time, while I was waiting for the new one to come out, I was hanging out on the developers' forums and talking to a lot of people, speculating as to what we might find in Chapter 3. So I'm excited to get back into that today. And we spoke to some of these people previously. Watching this flame burn reminds me of my life. Hot, yellow, flickering, constant yet chaotic within boundaries, and dull as hell. Oh, okay. So we were talking to these Salakian priests, and we are on this mission with Donovan and Sharla. Hello, this is a book about shopping. Speaking of which, buy some items from me. I sell them, you see. See? All right. And so, although we did have that mission with Donovan and Charlotte at the very beginning of chapter two, remember that we went into the gem mine with them when we were going after the bandits in there, Donovan and Charlotte went off in their own direction. So we have not actually partied with them previously. So we'll see that they are technically, they're only level 10. So they're a little ways behind Marduk. And Donovan is fire elemental and Charlotte is air elemental. We can see some of their items here. Donovan has an Ember Spear, which is an ornate spear containing a Fire Opal, 22 attack, lots of abilities, and also empowers fire. Now, we were talking a lot previously about how Emila's items, her various rods, were actually not capable of empowering their corresponding element. So I don't know if that's also the case for Donovan or not, but that just means that that last stat there may not mean much. And he has a bronze circlet, which is a helmet slash hat, which has one defense and one magic defense, which is actually pretty solid when you think about how in chapter two, our best helmets were the kettle hats, which had two physical defense. So the bronze circlets are similar, just a little bit of a split between physical and magical defense. It's sort of a small, thin crown set with a jasper gem and made of bronze. They're often worn by mages who can't wear full helmets. And there you get the explanation as to why Emma was unable to wear the kettle hat in chapter two. Comes a chapter later, but nonetheless still useful. Does actually have a defensive reaction, which is odd. We did not see any defensive reactions or any skills at all on the helmets that we saw in chapter two, but just gives us more ways to master those abilities. And also has a little bit of a bonus as well, plus 15 MP. So all in all, those bronze circlets actually turned out to be Fairly strong helmets. Not bad. Also see that they have a new chest plate that we have not yet seen. It is a Jasper robe. Has one defense and five magic defense. Again, actually quite strong. A mage's robe adorned with Jaspers. It also gives them a magic defensive reaction and also gives a little bit of spirit, a little bit of MP. Not bad at all. We see that Marduk has the same items that we finished chapter two with, which is all the more reason why the champion sword going through the Trilobite Cave and finishing the arena there was so significant because that means that we carry over a very strong weapon into Chapter 3. Bronze Shield, nothing special about that kettle hat like we were saying before. The Geo Jacket, another reason why this is so important to pick it up in Chapter 2, carries over into Chapter 3, and it is, as we saw in Chapter 2, extremely strong. Green Beads, also solid. Good magic defense, a little bit of earth resist, a little bit of life. And the Fire Pendant, which I think to this day, Marduk may still not have mastered. That is true. <laughs> okay. And then we see that Donovan actually has one as well, which is, I suppose, a little bit fitting given how he does have a bit of a theme here, being very fire elemental focus. And then just a simple copper ring, which we've seen before, gives just one physical defense. Darla, very similar. Just instead of being fire elemental, everything is air elemental. So empowers air, some air skills, same helmet. Same chest plate, an air pendant rather than a fire pendant, and also a copper ring. So if we take a look at what the shopkeeper has, for the most part, it's just the potions that we've seen many times before. Remedy, which is actually quite good, removing all status effects. We have a few of these, however, I'm not actually sure if anyone was selling them previously, so not a terrible idea to stockpile some of those. They are somewhat expensive, though. Then the maces, we picked up at least some of those previously in Chapter 2. And then I believe these are new. The Alchemist Fire, really cold water, 
Liquid Lightning, and Bottle O Acid. So if we read more about these, we find that they are an expendable item, so they're somewhat like a potion in that way. However, they're a magical potion that explodes if under stress. Throwing it at an enemy will inflict fire damage, so it's actually an offensive potion. Really cold water, same general idea. This water is so frigid that it causes potent water-type damage when it comes into contact with anything. Liquid lightning is lightning magically converted to liquid form, somehow. It reverts to its true form when under stress, so throw it in someone's face for kicks, you sadist. Pots, you deserve to be in prison. And the bottle acid is good old-fashioned. Bottle of scalding acid, just like Mother used to make. Love it at Summit! So, those are a little bit of a new way for us to deal some damage, if that is of interest. Don't think that it's urgent for us to pick that stuff up yet, but might be something that's of interest later. And there we see 3,000 coins in that random chest there. Not bad at all, that is a hefty sum. And here, if we speak to the Salakian priest, we see, I keep all the money I own in the world in an ornate treasure chest over there. I've been saving up for years. I'd probably consider suicide if it was stolen, you know, because my life would be ruined. My girlfriend would leave me and so on. Or she would if I had one. Being a priest, I don't really see many girls at all. You know, since we have to live in this remote temple and swear about vow of celibacy and so on. A shame too, what with my stunning good looks. Well, sorry about that. Okay, and there are a few more priests that I don't believe we've yet spoken to. I think we've spoken to this guy. That is, of course, the head priest, because as you can tell, he has the silliest hat. So let's, perhaps, eh, let's talk to him now. And confirmed, he is the high priest, Shamash. You are the royal knights, sent to aid us with our plight, yes? Well, that's right. We heard you were having trouble with monsters in your temple. If you know what I mean. That is correct. Normally there are monsters at the deepest level of the temple, but we generally stay away from those parts anyway, and the monsters are never a bother. Recently, however, the monsters have been ascending, taking up residence in the higher areas, and therefore endangering us and hindering our passage through our own temple. There are also some strange monsters amongst them that we have never seen before. Okay, so we can ask a few questions here. We can ask when it started. We know what might be responsible. Sure. It started a few days ago. We thought it might just be monsters being particularly wild. Breeding season or something, you know? But we were unable to control them, and they just kept coming more and more. There was a strange man who entered the temple a day or so before the monsters started becoming wild, however... We suspect he is to blame. Hmm, yeah, what did this suspicious gentleman look like? I don't see the relevance of that, but he was large, muscled, looked dark, had an eye patch. He was probably really bossy and arrogant and just thrust himself into the depths of our temple, saying that just wanted to look around. We let him as visitors are welcome here to look around as much as they please. But he did not return, and then the monsters started acting up. Well, we shall look around and solve your problem. Yes, we'll explore the temple and try to find this man, and do what we can to help. Worry not, we are the Royal Knights of Gosnor. We always get our job done. Thank you, and I wish you luck. But wait, there's a device deep within the temple, called the Warding Stone, which usually protects us from this sort of thing. I don't know much about it, since it's been untouched and unseen since my grandfather's time, but I think it may be significant. Perhaps the Warding Stone is broken, or stolen. If that is the case, we have spares for such a scenario. I'll give one to you. I wouldn't know what to do with it, however, but I'm sure you can work it out, oh resourceful knights. Okay, so there is our primary mission. Let's make it down there and figure out what's going on with all these monsters in this area. And if we speak to this priest here, the side quest priest, something tells me we may find a side quest. Oh, hello there. <laughs> you're, you're the knights who are meant to be going down to the lower levels, right? Splendid. I have a favor to ask of you. 
Uh, I mean, since you'll be going down there anyway. You see, the monsters in the lower levels only appeared recently. When they did, we had to evacuate the lower levels, but not all of us got out. Some of the priests were either too absorbed in their studies or meditation, reading, or just, you know, milking their snakes and couldn't get out fast enough. We were too scared to go down and help them ourselves. We're only like level one, despite lifetimes of priestitution. And the monsters down there are at least level 10. Now that you are here, you are our shining ray of hope. I hope you'll go and rescue them, yes? I won't take, no, I don't want to do this and I want them to die, as an answer. Here, just take these warp stones to the four priests, one for each. With them, they can escape safely. Come back if you save them all, and I'll make it worth your while. I promise, big boy. Mm, okay, a little odd, but I suppose we can make that work, and I believe that is all the priests here. We can double check our map, but I'm fairly certain that we've spoken to all of them at this stage. So let's head on down into the temple. Heh, Royal Knights, that's what we are indeed. Such a great honor. Such a great feeling to know that we're actually helping these people in need. Isn't it so invigorating and exciting, Sharla? Um, it is, but I'm sort of scared. Don't worry, I'll be here to protect you, and I'm sure the monsters won't stand against our amazing magical power. <laughs> oh, and Marduk's with us too, of course. And we all know how good he is at this sort of thing. You've been doing this for three years, right, Marduk? And every mission has been a quick success. Well, I am that great. <laughs> you are indeed. You'd make Social Fox proud, you know. Well, I'm trying my best. I myself. Tried to make Dugan proud. Oh, but you're not alone, Marduk. You still have Sharla and I. And we shall try our best, too. We're new at this Royal Knight thing, but we'll prove that we're worthy of the title. I can't imagine these night missions are too much harder than the guard ones, so come on, let's go. But who will remind me of the menus and controls, and I'll get all confused and not know what he's talking about? Who will tell me that A opens the menu, and we have to use rusty keys on reactions and battles and stuff? You mean you don't already know all that? And we are here, depending on your experienced leadership? I thought you were Sir Marduk, the reliable and powerful Royal Knight of Gosnor. You're a legend, you know. You inspire everyone in the Guard, and even the Knights, carrying on with vigor and lightheartedness despite your great loss. But to keep inspiring them, you have to keep it up. Dugan wouldn't want you moping around about the past, would he? Now is your time to shine, and make him proud. So come on, Marduk. Let's just focus on the task at hand, eh? Okay. And there is a save crystal here. I mean, there's a save crystal not far from here. In the early stages of the temple, but I suppose we can save here as well. And we can pick up some remedies and actually... Marduk's inventory is completely full. Which might be reason to offload some things real quick. So we go to item storage. Oh, item storage is also full. Maybe better yet would be to dump some things on Darla and Donovan here. Mostly looks like we just have many of the leftovers from chapter three. From chapter two, I should say. And those have been carried over into chapter three, much like with our inventories themselves. We're mostly just looking to give ourselves a little bit of space so that Marty can actually hold things, so everyone does still have their own independent inventory, as we saw in Chapter 2, of course. Which does actually mean that we are capable of holding on to more things, given how there are more people. As you can see, we have Marduk, Donovan, and Sharla. However, no sign of Zack or Vern yet, obviously. Uh, Dugan, definitely not, and Emla also disappeared at the end of Chapter 2. So we'll see if we can reconvene with any of our old friends, or perhaps find some new ones. And that does mean that we have some other items that could potentially be useful for people like Donovan and Sharla. So let's take a moment here, double check our skills. Marduk, I'm assuming, is oh, more or less all set from a reaction standpoint, because again, we see the things that we had 
in chapter two are carrying over into chapter three. As for Donovan and Sharla, however, definitely not the case. We have Soul Strike, which was actually an offensive reaction that we saw Zack with in chapter two. Donovan has it as well, however, Donovan, being in Fire Elemental character, makes his attacks Fire Elemental, whereas Zack, being an Air Elemental character, was making his attacks Air Elemental in Chapter 2. Defensively, a little bit of reactions there, also from a magic standpoint too. Except, ooh, okay. So Donovan does not have the RP to do both the generic minus 20% damage and the minus 50% Fire magic damage. This is the one that's coming from the Fire Pendant that Marduk has also not yet mastered. I think it's probably best to focus on the more generic damage because it's more generally applicable. And also, I believe this is coming from his chest plate, and we certainly have many chest plates that we'll want to put on as well for many other skills. And if we check similar stuff for Sharla, I think we'll find that she'll have access to many of the same skills. However, offensively, she can increase her air elemental damage. Whereas again, Donovan was doing fire. And we see in terms of active skills, she has Lightning Bolt, which is an electric heavenly zap that inflicts air damage. Whereas Donovan has Flame. Makes the target erupt into flames, inflicting fire damage, which are actually the same skills, or at least two of the same skills that Emla was using back in Chapter 2. This was her fire attack. This was her air attack. However, what we'll find is that if we continue to look a little bit further at these two, Donovan is a Pyromancer, and Sharla is an Aeromancer, whereas Emla, I believe, was an Elementalist or something like that. That might be my inner Path of Exile player speaking out there. But basically, Emla was capable of using spells from any element, whereas Donovan and Sharla will instead be specializing in their own elements, Donovan being fire, Sharla being air. And also with their pendants, they have even more resistance to their own elements and even more weakness to the other one. So let's carry on here and see what we can find in this area. There are five chests, including one right down here. So let's check that out. Fire Opal, which is something we have not seen before. If we check it out, we will find that it gives the Wildfire ability, which at the moment, I believe we will find that no one can learn. However, plus one strength is a passive ability that it would appear that anyone could learn. And Donovan and Sharla, for their second accessory, are currently using just a copper ring, which gives one defense, which is not amazing by any stretch. So perhaps it might be better to give fire resistance and fire empowering abilities to Donovan, our fire character. So let's try that out. And I just want to double check as well. Did we manage to pick up the chests in the other area where we, of course, did not have inventory space because we had everyone loaded up on stuff? Does appear so. Here's our first battle, actually, of Chapter 3. We have a Moonstone and a Topaz. If we look more closely at them, we see that a Moonstone is Light Elemental. It is very strong against Light attacks. It heals to them very weak to dark, and in terms of elements, it is has a little bit of a resistance across the board. As for the Topaz, similar idea, except air elemental in this case, making it very strong against air attacks and very weak against fire. So with that in mind, that probably means that if Sharla goes first here, we want to make sure that with her lightning bolt, we are attacking the Moonstone rather than the Topaz, because otherwise we'll be healing our opponents, which is Generally, not something we want to be doing. Whereas we want to be attacking the Topaz with Donovan because it is weak to fire. And I was not quick enough on that reaction there. Gem Explosion, an interesting ability from the Moonstone. Remove some magic defense. So that does mean that we are more vulnerable to future attacks here. Now, also bear in mind, remember that the Moonstone heals to light. And Marduk, his sword is light elemental right now. So if he were to attack, he would heal. So I'm actually going to deliberately pass on Marta here. Could theoretically opt to heal ourselves if we wanted to. But that's probably a little bit overkill. I was curious as to how much damage we could do with the physical attack there. And, well, with 20 defense, the answer is not much. Not much. Magic 
attacks are definitely the way to go. And Donovan and Charlotte, they have an interesting setup where both of them are a little bit of a hybrid character between physical attacks and magic attacks. There <laughs> you see they're finishing moves as well when we successfully make it through a fight. We get a Moonstone and we get a Topaz from each of those guys. Let's take a look at those two. And the Moonstone is very similar to the Fire Opal that we saw earlier, except this time, light-themed. Moonstones are quite common, so they aren't very valuable. However, they contain the potential of healing and the light element. So they actually give the regen ability, which is something that Marta can learn, and also the insomnia ability, which Marta has already gotten the chance to learn and master. And a little bit of magic defense, a little bit of light resistance. So that probably makes some sense to throw that on Marduk and Fire Pendant, maybe one day, maybe one day. So that's that. Topaz, this gen stone seems to have no weight at all. It is the air elemental stone, so it has healing wind, Twister, which is an ability that, again, you'll see that indicator there, the little tree is a skill or a set of skills that we do not yet have anyone who can use them. And then the plus one agility passive skill that we also saw from the bandit leather. And also gives a little bit of resistance to air, a little bit of empowering to air. Also, with these empowering abilities on the accessories, not sure if those work or do not work. But either way, I think we will find that that is best to put on Sharla. Because if we go back to our skills here, we will find that that healing wind is an ability for Sharla. It allows her to restore some HP and cure confusion, which is actually a status effect that I don't believe that Marduk can remove with any of his abilities at the moment. So we'll want to check that out. And it does also give the option to do plus one agility, so we can put that on Charlotte as well. As for Donovan, we can put plus one strength. And I don't think that he got anything else new from that. He did not. And then Marduk can learn the regen ability from this. Grants the target the regen status, which restores HP every turn. We may have seen this on a few occasions against bosses in the past, but for us to be able to apply that status on our own characters, sounds good. Then let's see if we can make our way through the rest of this area here. There are certainly more chests for us to find, including one down here. With some really cold water. We saw it previously at the vendor there. We'll throw it on Donovan. Again, it gives us the chance to deal some water damage with characters that might not otherwise be capable of dealing water damage. Four chests, a mithril sword, a sword forged from the highly unique to this setting metal called mithril. It's not an especially exciting sword. Its favorite color is probably gray. So if we take a look at that, let's see what the deal is. It has 26 base damage, which is lower than Marduk's current sword, and it is a sword, so that does mean that it would be something that Marduk could theoretically use. It does give the plus 10% damage offensive reaction. So if, say, we were to try that on Marduk, he has already learned that I believe it is one of the weaker weapons. Yeah, the Iron Sword would have previously been our alternative to learn that ability. That only has 20 base attack, whereas the Mithril Sword has 26, so it's basically just a better version of the Iron Sword. But not bad. What is the deal here? Odd. Odd. There is one more chest down here. Let's make sure we nab that before we head on deeper into the temple. Some better potions. Healing 200 HP. 10 of them, no less. Let's put them on Sharla and theoretically probably should split those a bit between the group. So one other thing that I want to mention is that in Marduk 2, I have played that game many, many times. That battle is actually so strong that we are not even allowed to skip it, even if we wanted to. And here we see some new enemies. The Topaz, that's familiar, yes. But these Sekel are fish, flying fish at that. They are technically undead. And they are very strong against dark, very weak to light, earth, air, and a little bit weak to fire. So that should mean that we have a, a reasonable way to take them out. They do have fairly high defense. So that is also something we might want to consider, is that magic attacks are going to be more effective. So particularly with Sharla, I think it makes sense to attack them because we know the Topaz is not a good fit. 
given how that would heal if it were hit with air attacks. And then Donovan probably does make sense to attack the Topaz there, because it's weak to fire. And that will mean the Seckle gets one turn here using Bubble Rot? A little odd. But apparently a dark magical attack. And then here is the regen ability. So we just saw Marduk pick up. So we can apply it on Charla, and it basically means that every time the person with the regen takes a turn, they restore, I believe it's 10% of their HP. So Charla having about 270 HP. Regen's 27 HP per turn. And once again, let's use the lightning bolt to take this guy out. So, short term, it's definitely not the most effective way to heal, but if you're expecting to have a long battle, like against a boss, then that might be more effective than healing more directly. It does also mean that you only need to apply it once, and then it happens every turn, so you don't need to have Marduk healing every single time someone takes damage, which is also convenient. Let's take a look at what's happening here. This is a very large area with seven chests. And... As for what we will find here, looks like there are many paths through which we could go. Including this one blocked by a Revenant. Which is a bit of an intimidating sight because this guy looks rather tough. High attack, 35. Some defense, some magic defense. Very resistant to light. And some weakness to both air and fire. So that does mean that Probably a good fit for Donovan or Charlotte to attack. Not so great for Marduk. So you'll find that as we are going through this temple here, we're fighting enemies that have, generally speaking, very different types of elements than we were seeing for the majority of Chapter 2. Chapter 2, of course, being the chapter in which we saw a lot of Morik and his undead friends. So lots of earth, lots of dark, not a lot of light at all. A little bit of air here and there. But we're going to see a lot of light elemental foes down here, as we've already seen. And so that is a bit of a change, and it does mean that at least for the time being, Marduk is going to find it quite difficult to deal damage with his normal attack. At least while he is equipping his current sword, that is light elemental. And that's why I was saying the Revenant, a little scary, it does hit quite hard. So, we could use Healing Wind here, which we saw Charlotte pick up, and previously... Marduk was the only person who had access to healing abilities. Of course, anyone could use a healing item. However, here we find that Charla can heal on herself quite a bit at that. And because healing is based on a character's spirit, which Charla has 18 of, whereas Marduk only has 12, does actually mean that Charla is typically going to be a stronger healer. At least the amount of damage she can heal will be higher. Of course, Marduk does have access to a series of different healing and status removing abilities. So that's a little bit different, makes Marduk a little more versatile. And here we actually see the Sun Axe, which is that axe that that enemy was just holding. And I vaguely remember that in times past, I had gone through this area and tried fighting those guys time and time again in anticipation, in hopes of getting the Sun Axe, because I thought that at least Initially, in the Flash version of this game, I want to say it was about a 5% drop chance, and I just could not get it. This time, we got it the first time round, which is great. However, I'm not sure there's a chance that maybe those drop chances have changed, because we saw that in Chapter 2, the Keyblade, which previously had, I believe it was a 1% drop chance against the Zombie Locksmith, has actually turned into a guaranteed drop. So, with that being such a huge change... I do wonder if maybe there are other items that have also become more common drops, but it is also a great axe. We saw one or two of these in Chapter 2 as well, and didn't have anyone who could equip it, but it's blessed by Solak, deity of suns, in case that wasn't clear. <laughs> and that is also an explanation, I suppose, for why there are so many light elemental, air elemental, a little bit of fire elemental people in this area, and less so of the dark and earth. And so this... Axe is Light Elemental, 35 base damage. And if we go here, I believe we will find something else that is new with Chapter 3. That being that sometimes chests have monsters in them. So, on this occasion, we find that in this chest there are a couple of Blood Lizards. Rather grim. 
However, we'll find that they have zero defense, zero magic defense, very weak, the water, very resistant to fire. That means that Donovan's gonna find things difficult here, but outside of that, these guys what? might not be too difficult. Outside of, you know, the fact that they can breathe fire at us and bite us. So Donovan, you're gonna find things a little bit tricky here. What with them having 70% fire resistance, that means that your attacks, whether they be spells or physical attacks, not gonna do too much. However, I forget, it might be that if we use a normal attack with Donovan and deliberately miss our offensive reactions, then it won't trigger Soul Strike. Soul Strike would guarantee that it's fire elemental. It might be that his non-Soul Strike attacks are non-elemental, in which case that might be enough to, well, nope, they're still fire elemental. I was gonna say that might be a way to get a little bit more damage out of them. Not on this occasion though. So here's an example of, like I was saying before, if we were to heal outright, we would get more healing in the short term than if we were to use regen. Donovan, he is fairly hurt at the moment, so let's use a heal. Make sure that he doesn't get taken out here, rather than using regen. And I'm hoping that Sharla can take this guy out, but I'm not sure because it's going to be close. Not quite. So these guys ooh, can also inflict numb and fire. Ooh, he is especially powerful against era elemental characters, and so you saw that that fire breath dealt a lot of damage to Sharla. Which is not great, because she was our primary source of damage. So we could potentially finish off the Blood Lizard here with Donovan. He is, of course, not going to deal too much damage. He does have a Phoenix down. I suppose we'll use it here. Don't feel great about it. Let's use Marduk to take out the Blood Lizard. I do think he will have the most damage. Or maybe even this one here. Let's try it. He has more than enough to one-shot them. But I think that is key in this case, is in Chapter 2, Marduk, for the most part, was not one of the primary damage dealers. We had Vern and Zack being our primary single-target people, whereas Emla was capable of taking down many people at once. However, at least to start here, Marduk could very well be our primary source of DPS. Here is our Sun Sword drop, which actually is another sword which has, again, lower damage than the Champion Sword, 32 versus 28. Again, just further justification for going through the effort of picking up the Champion Sword in Chapter 2. It is that good. This is a Holy Blade, blessed by Solak, God of Suns. It inflicts light elemental damage, so similar to the Champion Sword, except worse. It has less damage and it has less crit chance. It is also light elemental, it also gives the plus 20% damage offensive reaction, which, again, there's probably a sword we have buried in here somewhere. Yeah, the long sword that has that same reaction. It's just, it says 10 base damage, whereas this has 28. So it's a much better version of the long sword, essentially. So if we do find that we want to have someone learn the plus 20% damage reaction, then we probably want to give them the sun sword rather than the long sword. And so in that case, reason why we got that Sun Sword is because although we triggered that battle by opening the chest, that did also guarantee that we got a specific drop. So it's basically like a delayed treasure chest. You still get the reward, it's just you only get it at the end of the fight. So we will find that oftentimes those special chests, the ones that have battles in them, are particularly rewarding. There is also a healing crystal here now. This is also a reason why it might have made sense to deliberately not use a phoenix down which is relatively scarce and valuable resource on charla there maybe might have paid off to just wait it out a bit but either way i think this is probably a good place for us to wrap up here so there's our first look at what it is like to delve into marduk 3 and i am looking forward to getting a chance to look even more so i'll catch you next time